Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Awesome. We are on our series called Building Bridges and uh, last week we had an awesome time talking about the bridge to God is Jesus. And today I continue that series and the message today is that we are called to build. We are called to build bridges. Uh, my son, he loves building bridges. He uses anything and everything he can find. This is crazy. He uses dominoes to build bridges. I don't know how he does it. I don't even know how he has the patience to do it. Taking time to stack them up until they can actually hold up different dominoes. He's used popsicle sticks, of course, Legos. I don't know what his fascination is with bridges, but I've noticed in my life that God actually uses bridges too to remind me of the importance of helping people find God. But there's another thing that I also have seen God do is he reminds me of helping people reconcile with each other. God has given me a burden to help people get along, help people fix brokenness in families and friendships, maybe in marriages. I've had a burden to help bring unity and division in our world. Uh, that's a big one right now, right? There's a lot of bridge building needs to take place in our society. It could be the skeptic or the unbeliever, the doubter. I have a burden to see we believers help them have a safe place to question and to ask things and to wonder and to, to really just be with us without being shunned or pushed out. We have a great burden to help people come to God. And we have a great burden to help people feel, that, this is a big one, to help people feel like they are loved and welcomed in church. Amen. There is nothing worse than hearing how much God loves and Jesus loves, and then when, when we're around church people or Christians, that's not what people experience. And it's, that is not easy to build those bridges sometimes when some people have preconceived ideas already about us because of culture, because of our world. All of those situations that I'm talking about just now takes us. Today I want to show you in scripture that God uses us to build bridges. And I want to show you some people he called to be builders of bridges. And we're going to turn to John chapter 1 and we are going to go through John chapter 1 together. And we're going to look through this. So grab your phones if you need to. You can use uh, your phones on, your, on the app. You can Google it if you have to, John chapter 1, and I'm using New Living Translation. And there's a word in here, and the first few verses I'm going to explain to you, because this is that eternal bridge that we were talking about last week, and the word is, ready, the word. Word. What does word mean in this portion of scripture we're about to read? It means Jesus or logos or logos. Some people pronounce it different ways. But in the Greek, it's referring to Jesus. So when we read this word, word, we're talking about Jesus. I want you to be aware of that. So you're like, what in the world is that? So let's, let's read this. In the beginning, the word or Jesus already existed. The word was with God. And the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him. See, the, the word him is explaining word, so it has to be a person. It's the person of Christ. And nothing was created except through him. The word, or Jesus, gave life to everything that was created. And his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Praise God. 
Praise God. God sent a man. This is the part. This is the, the human bridges to Jesus. We are bridges to Jesus, to God. It says this, God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. Now, John the Baptist, real quick, let me pause. He was not, uh, if I would do like an equivalent to today, imagine we go to Silver Lake and a person who appears to be homeless is preaching. This is what he looked like. John wore burlap. He was eating wild locusts and honey. He probably had long hair. He looked a little barbaric, okay? And he's preaching by this water to baptize people. And that's the man that people are drawn to. Isn't that interesting? This is what and some people might even think, people on the corners who yell out on bullhorns and such. But this is a little different in this context. It goes on to say that John was to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. Verse 8, John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created. You ready for this? But the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, the Jews, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Now we have to remember this letter was written later on. So John is writing years later, talking about what Jesus did. Okay? So he's, we're in the situation with John, but he's also John the Baptist. The apostle John the one who was closest to Jesus is writing, and they're not the same people. And so he's saying to all who believed him, because what happened next was the Greeks and the Gentiles and the Romans, they started, they started believing in Jesus. And he, he gave them the right to become children of God. Verse 13 says, they are reborn, not with a physical rebirth, or not a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. He's talking about a spiritual birth, to be reborn. So the word, Jesus, became human and made his home among us. Christmas time, we celebrate that, right? He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, this is the one I was talking about when I said, someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. From his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one, Notice the capitalized one, who is himself God, talking about Jesus here, is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. I read a commentary that said this, because this is the bridge to God. Jesus is the bridge to God. We learned that last week. Why did they use the word logos or logos? We'll go with logos. It's to speak. It's to communicate. And the best way to communicate was to, for God to know, when we, now when we speak, what do we do? We share thoughts. We share truth. We, we communicate what we want here to get to your, right now you're receiving what I'm saying in your heart and your mind, right? What's the best way for God to communicate what he wants you to know? Well, that is Logos. Jesus. But he didn't just say it, he sent Jesus down to show it. That's powerful. That is powerful. So verse 19 says this. This was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you? He came right out and said, I am not the Messiah. Let me tell you, I'm not the Messiah. 
Well then, who are you? They asked. Are you Elijah? Elijah, a great prophet in the Old Testament? No, he replied. Are you the prophet we are expecting? No. Then who are you? We need an answer for those who sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? And John replied in the words of the prophet Isaiah, because Isaiah prophesied about John the Baptist hundreds of years before. I am a voice shouting in the wilderness, clear the way for the Lord's coming. Then the Pharisees who have been sent asked him, if you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet, what right do you have to baptize? And John told them, I baptize with water, but right here in the crowd is someone you do not recognize. Though his ministry follows mine, I'm not even worthy to be a slave and untie the straps of his sandal. This encounter took place in Bethany, an area east of the Jordan River where John was baptizing. Now the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. What he's saying here is, is as he was going to baptize, Jesus was going to show up and eventually he would baptize the Messiah. This is how he knew that he had baptized them. Ready? Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. We have Jesus and the Holy Spirit in one moment in this water. This is why we know there's a trinity, that there is one God Three persons, the Trinity. But, but John kept saying, testify, I testify, look. Well, let's keep going. The following day, John was again standing with his two disciples. So John, the Baptist, has disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, look, there is the Lamb of God. This is the second time he's done this. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Notice that. They left John the Baptist to follow Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. And it was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying. And they remained with him the rest of the day. Andrew Simon Peter's brother was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip said. As they approached, Jesus said, now here is a genuine son of, of Israel, a man of complete integrity. How do you know about me? Nathanael asked. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Then Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Jesus asked him, do you believe this? Just because I told you I had seen you under the fig tree, you will see greater things than this. Then he said, I tell you the truth, you will all see heaven open and the angels of God coming up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is a stairway between heaven and earth. Amen. That's a long chapter. <clears throat> By the way, that moment of seeing the angels and the Son of Man and God, that is the moment of his ascension when he would rise up after his resurrection and go to be with his father. 
That was a long chapter, but I want you to see the simplicity of the bridges that took place in this scripture. John, his life, his calling was to prepare and point people to Jesus. John was right where he belonged at the right time. He obeyed his calling in his life. He obeyed his role and what he was supposed to do. He did what God called him to do. And at the right time, the right day, the right moment, he did exactly what he was supposed to do. And guess what? The next day he kept doing what he was supposed to do. And the next day he did what he was supposed to do. Do not discredit your daily obedience to God. As we obey God, his presence, what we do, will be manifested. His presence will be seen by others. When we obey God and do what his word says, we will be in the right place at the right time for someone to come to Christ. And I love what John the Baptist did. He didn't point to himself. He always pointed to Jesus. I'm not the Messiah. And two times we see, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He even lost followers because Jesus was more important. Mm. Mm. He lost followers because... He kept saying, there's Jesus, and they left John to be with Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is greater. And even John says that I must become less so that he may become greater. John was called to be a bridge. We are called to be a bridge. And as we serve and obey God, we will be in a moment where our lives point to Jesus. Do not, again, let me say this, do not discredit your daily obedience because when we obey God and serve others, we end up being a bridge for God's glory to be manifested. But here's the thing. John was also a bridge for Andrew to find Jesus and impacted by what John said, Andrew leaves John and goes to Jesus and starts to follow him. And what does Andrew do? Andrew goes to his brother Peter, which is the rock of the church, and says, come and see the Messiah. Come and see the one, the Messiah. So now Andrew's going to his family member and he's saying, just just come and see. Come and see. Well, we see that Peter eventually follows Jesus. And Jesus isn't done calling people to follow him so they can be fishers of men. So he goes to Philip and invites Philip to follow him. And what does Philip do? He invites Nathaniel, a friend, right? So now we have John pointing to Jesus, John pointing Andrew to Jesus. Andrew follows Jesus, then is like, let me go get my brother and just keep spreading and multiplying. Everyone coming to Christ because of relationship. I love what Jesus said. He says, come and see. And then later on, he says, come and follow me. But do you notice that he never says, come believe in me? We will find that some people will have to come and see what Jesus is all about for some time. And during that time, how we represent Jesus is extremely important. And many people followed Jesus for a while before they truly believed. And so here in this church or in your home or at your workplace, inviting people to come and see first is not a bad idea. I get a little nervous sometimes when we rush the process and say, hey, believe, believe, believe. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. It's best that people come and see for themselves and witness Jesus in us or through the word of God, reading the Bible, hearing about Jesus over and over again so they can believe for themselves and not feel forced to believe. Jesus said in in Mark 3, 14, come and be with 
me. And I will make you fishers of men. So as we follow Jesus with our whole hearts, letting him mold and make us into he, who he desires, we become bridges for the lost. The bottom line today is our lives are bridges to Jesus. And it looks like God used mankind to point to Jesus, and now Jesus calls us to go and show and tell his message. Our lives, this hit me last night. I wrote this down last night. Our lives will bridge people to something or someone. The question is, what is it? Take a little eval of your life real quick. What is your life bridging people to? What is your life connecting people to? What do your words connect people to? What do your actions show people? Because what we are passionate about, we tend to bridge people to. The biggest one is our children. Our children see everything about us. And here's the thing about this scripture. It appears that you're the most effective bridge to Jesus. Not to God. Jesus is that one. You're the most effective bridge to Jesus. I always say this. You are God's greatest reach. Outside of Jesus, you're God's greatest reach. Because we are witnesses of his power in our lives. A study was done in 1955. It was a book by Donald McGavern, a missionary to India, who did research on this one question. What person or thing led you to put your faith in Christ. Now, he discovered here in his studying and survey in 1955 that people in India did not come to faith through revivals, mass crusades, or chance encounters. Rather, they came largely through family relationships and friendships. You ready for this? I just found this this past week. What he called the bridges of God. As he might put it today, we are the bridges over which others walk to find salvation in Jesus Christ. Well, North American leaders did not read his book. And it was 25 years later where a church growth researcher by the name of Wynn Arne, building on the initial discoveries of Donald McGavern, conducted one of the largest studies of how people come to faith in Christ and to the church in the United States and Canada. And Arne's Institute for American Church Growth surveyed over 17,000 people in 1980, asking who or what was responsible for your coming to Christ. And you ready for this? The statistics were staggering. 75 to 90% of those who came to Christ was through a family member or friend inviting them to come and see Jesus. You are the most effective bridge to bring people to Jesus. I don't care if you don't feel like it. Well, I do. I do care about that, actually. I don't want you to care how you feel about being a worthy bridge or not. We will deal with that in a moment. But the reality is you are an effective bridge. And another metaphor that Jesus used was in Matthew 5, 14 through 16. He referred to us as light. Jesus said, you will show the way, light the way. Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Amen. How we live, how we shine is crucial because we can point people to Jesus. John the Baptist's life glorified Jesus. Every life in this room and online glorifies something. 
We shine. We, we shine light on something. We reveal. We bridge something. The question is, again, what is it? John used his life to glorify Jesus. Jesus calls every day ordinary fishermen to become the next bridge or light to glorify his message, to spread the message. You're kind of wondering, maybe like I am, what did Jesus see in the disciples? What did he see? I mean, we're talking about fishermen who were not educated, who, who did not spend their lives studying the Torah and the scriptures and the prophets. If there was anyone he would pick, it wouldn't be them. But he does. And it gives you a little hope, right? Okay, God can use anyone. Jesus surrounded himself, what am I trying to say? Jesus surrounded himself with some bridges who needed work. And Jesus saw restored and useful men. Jesus doesn't just see who you are. He sees who you will become in him. As you are with him, as you follow him, Jesus sees ladies and gentlemen, who you will become in him. I've been a coach for a soccer team. I'm a teacher when it comes to a biblical classroom. I've been a leader, a mentor, and I have never once been there for a perfect student or player. I have never had a perfect player on my soccer teams. I have never had a perfect student in class. I've never, I've never mentored a perfect person. Did you know that? Because there is none, right? There is no perfect people in the world. And I have to believe that Jesus knew that and said, let me just get a hold of you and see what I can do in you and through you. Maybe you feel like you are under no condition to be a bridge today. No condition to help people come to Jesus right now. That's just not happening. And that, that's okay. It is. Because there are seasons where we're under construction. Anyone ever go over some bridges or you're like a little scared to go over? You've seen, you know, this, there's been a lot of bridge repair over the past, you know, four years or so. There's been some bridges, you know, I'd be a little nervous to go over. And we can feel that way about ourselves, that I'm not able to do that. Maybe you're saying, I'm still healing right now. I'm still learning. I'm still overcoming some things. Well, I want to encourage you that if you're letting Jesus work on you, you will become a great example of what God can do. But we can't, we can't be the bridge we're meant to be if we're not at least following Jesus first and being with him and letting him work on us and letting him get real with us. And whether it's, you, whether it's we're going to, to meet with a pastor or a fellow brother and sister in Christ or a counselor or a spiritual mentor or leader, we have to, this is why this the Together series last month was so important. We have to let people speak into our lives and we have to let people know what's going on in our lives because you're not going to be a broken bridge for your whole life. It's not supposed to be that way. Jesus came to fix, to restore, to set free. Please don't live in that state forever. You do not have to. Can I get an amen, please? You don't have to do that. But we know the only person who can fix the soul is Jesus himself. So we're not going to get fixed by hanging out with TV. Definitely not right now. <laughs> Jesus wants to restore you, to use you. And guess what? I don't care how much you hang out with Jesus, you're still not perfect. I'm still fragile. I'm like one of those 
bridges that sway when you go over it. Yikes. Here's what's important to remember. You're not Jesus, but your life illustrates what he can do in us. You don't have to be Jesus. You, have to be, you just have to be a follower of Jesus. You have to be like him. You don't have to be Jesus. You're not meant to be Jesus. I was reflecting, talking about following Jesus. I've been reflecting on what it means to follow Jesus. I'm going to close with these, these words. And I thought past the literal idea of walking and learning, like following Jesus as walking and learning. I thought past that, and I concluded that to follow Jesus is to make him the most important person in my world. Think about that for a second. To follow Jesus is to unfollow everyone else and be fully devoted to Christ. Does that mean that we don't love our family? No, of course not. Does that mean we're not devoted to, to other people? Of course not. We should be devoted to other people. We should be there for our family, our spouses, our kids, our neighbors. That's not what it is. Jesus literally just teaches in the word of God, though, to love him more than anyone else. And the beautiful result of that is that every relationship around you is blessed because you're more like Jesus when he's the most important person in your world and you're following him. And what's beautiful is people are going to notice that you're different. People are going to come to you to talk. They're going to, they're going to come to you because they see joy in the midst of the chaos in our world right now. I had something that God put on my heart. I'm going to say it today. I didn't know I was supposed to. I'm going to say it now. I'm usually careful with these things because if it's not on my outline, God gives me a whole week to make sure I have what I need on my outline, right? But sometimes God speaks to me on Saturday or Sunday morning to lay something on this church. We believers should not be panicking in the world we're living in right now. Listen, and for us who are growing and learning about God, I understand why you may have resorted to any kind of panic recently based off of what we're seeing going on in our world. But if we truly believe that God is sovereign and in charge and is good and is faithful, we do not have to panic. <laughs> Praise God. So when someone sees a bridge not shaking, they're going to be like, I'll go to that person right there. Because I want, it's like, the, it's like the ladies, what were they drinking? What kind of coffee do they have? When someone sees your steady peace, your steady bridge, not perfect, they're going to come to you and go, what are you all about? And guess what you become all of a sudden? A bridge to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Our starting point, and this may make you a little uncomfortable, our starting point is to build relationships. I, I just want to give you a heads up. Following Jesus is not comfortable. There's, there's not much comfort in following Jesus. They left everything behind to follow Jesus. They put down their trade of fishing to follow Jesus and start a new trade of fishing for men, building bridges to, to God. We have to start spending quality time with people and start building those connections, those relationships. One of the best things you can do to build a bridge right now is to walk across the street and get to know your neighbor. Who would have known that it's that simple? Walk across the street. I heard someone ask me one time, do you know your neighbor's name? Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I should probably know their names. Walk across the street. Build a relationship. Why? I'm talking about the lost right now. Those who do not have the hope of Jesus Christ. Those who do not have the peace so they don't have to panic. They need to know what we know. And God is going to use you. You continue to follow Jesus. He will make you a steady bridge to cross. I promise you that. Invite people into your life. I close with this. 
Grab a coffee. Go out to dinner with someone. Go for a walk. Go fishing. Go fishing. When, the, when COVID first hit, one of our brothers went fishing and led a man to the Lord six feet away. Right next to him. And now he is in community groups here. He's read, someone made him a custom Bible with his name engraved on it. He's studying the word of God. He's following Jesus because he went fishing. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because here's what's going to happen. When Jesus is the most important person in your world, people are watching. And they're going to know why your world is so different than theirs. And guess what? That bridge was lowered, and now they're walking on to hear more. Let's stand together and pray. So, your task this week is to have a conversation with someone. Maybe go for a walk. Maybe go fishing. Just do something you enjoy with someone maybe you do not know or someone that God has already been putting on your heart to minister to. Just begin to build that connection. It may take a year before anything happens. At least put the ramp down. At least start laying down the concrete and the bridge. Amen. God, we thank you today that you would see us as worthy vessels, worthy connections and instruments, bridges to bring people to you. We thank you, God, that you make us steady and strong. And as we are with your son, Jesus, as we have Jesus dwelling in us, we will be steady bridges for those around us. We thank you for that additional message today we needed to hear. Lord, bring people into our lives and may we be brave and get a little uncomfortable to go to people and build those connections. For the sake of the lost, for the sake of the skeptic or unbeliever, for the sake of those who have been hurt even by religion, for those who have a misconception of you or the church or Jesus, whoever it may be, for our wayward kids, God, help us to be bridges. Lord, help us. We thank you. We praise you. And we glorify your name this week. We point to you. In Jesus' name, amen.